Hare Krishna, my friends. Welcome to Bhaktiville. Here we are, Bhaktiville. It's Nectar of Devotion because it's Friday night. So here, I'm here with Greece, Bhakti Greece, and Bhakti Mimulus. And uh, welcome to all of you who are listening to us uh, live streaming on Facebook or on YouTube. Welcome. So tonight we're continuing with our reading from last week. Uh, we've been reading about the qualities of indirect ecstasies of devotional service. Uh, we'll be continuing with astonishment and chivalry, and then tonight we'll be reading more about compassion and anger. We're on page 373 of the book, or page 112 of the PDF. Oh, I made some typos in that. Anyway, there we are. That's where we're at. But before we get started, let me offer my obeisances to Srila Prabhupada, who translated this summary of Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu so that we could know more and dive deeper into this ocean of devotional service. Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prashtaya Bhutale Srimati Bhaktivedanta Swam and Itinamani. I offer my respectful obeisances unto His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, who is very dear to Lord Krishna, having taken shelter at His lotus feet. Anchakalpa Trubhishcha Kripasindu Bhevacha Patitanam Pavanavyo Vaishnavavyo Namo Namaha I also offer my respectful obeisances unto the Vaishnava devotees of the Lord here and in the whole universe. They are just like desired trees and can fulfill the desires of everyone and they are full of compassion for the fallen conditioned souls. Die. All right, so we're going to start on page 373 of the book or 412 of the PDF. And we'll read a little bit of what we read last week just for continuity's sake. Once Krishna challenged all his friends. Oh, so this is the section on chivalry and astonishment. So there's a lot of these boys fighting and doing all these things. So once Krishna challenged all his friends and said, quote, My dear friends, just see, I am jumping with great chivalrous, prow chivalrous prowess. Please do not flee. End quote. Upon hearing these challenging words, another friend named Varutapa counter-challenged the Lord and struggled against him. One of the friends once remarked, quote, Sudama is trying his best to see Damodar defeated, and I think that if our powerful Subal joins him, they will be a very beautiful combination, like a valuable jewel bedecked with gold, end quote. So Damodar in that sentence is Krishna. In these chivalrous activities, only Krishna's friends can be the opponents. Krishna's enemies can never actually be his opponents. Therefore, this challenging by Krishna's friends excuse me, oh, sorry, is called devotional service in chivalrous activities. Dhanavira, or chivalry in the giving of charity, can be divided into two parts, munificence and renunciation. A person who can sacrifice everything for the satisfaction of Krishna is called munificent. When a person desires to make a sacrifice because of his seeing Krishna, Krishna is called the impetus of the munificent activity. When Krishna appeared as the son of Nanda Maharaj in clear consciousness, or in clear consciousness, Nanda Maharaj desired all auspiciousness for his son and thus began to give in charity valuable cows to all the brahmanas. The brahmanas were so satisfied by this charitable action that they were obliged to say that the charity of Nanda Maharaj had excelled the charity of such past kings of, uh, such as Maharaj Brito and Rika. When a person knows the glories of the Lord completely and is prepared to sacrifice everything for the Lord, he is called Sampradhanaka, or one who gives everything in charity for the sake of Krishna. 
When Maharaj Yudhishthir went with Krishna in the arena of the Rajasuya sacrifice, in his imagination, he began to anoint the body of Krishna with pulp of sandalwood. He decorated him with a garland hanging down to his knees. He began to give him garments all embroidered with gold. He gave him ornaments all bedecked with valuable jewels. He gave him many fully decorated elephants, chariots, and horses. He further wished to give Krishna in charity his kingdom, his family, and his personal self also. After so desiring, when there was nothing to actually give in charity, Maharaj Yudhisthira became very perturbed and anxious. Similarly, Maharaj Bali once told his priest, Sukracharya, quote, My dear sage, you are fully expert in knowledge of the Vedas, and as such, you worship the Supreme Personality of Godhead Vishnu by Vedic rituals. As far as this Brahmana dwarf, the incarnation Vamanadeva, is concerned, if he is Lord Vishnu, a simple Brahmana, or even my enemy, I have decided to give to him in charity all the land that he has asked for, end quote. So that's the story of Vamanadeva. You know, he, he goes to Bali Maharaj because he's disturbing the world with all of his stuff, all of his bad stuff going on, and, and just simply goes and asks for three steps of land. And the first step he covers the whole world, and the second step he covers the whole universe, pokes his foot through the, the outer shell of the universe, and water starts rushing in. And then the third step, Bali Maharaj is so, so upset that he offers his head for Vamana Dave to step on. So that's the story, Bali Maharaj. All right. Maharaj Bali was so fortunate that the Lord extended him before him his hand, which was reddish from touching the breast of the goddess of fortune, who was always smeared with red kumkum powder. In other words, although the personality of Godhead is so great that the goddess of fortune is always under his command for enjoyment, he still extended his hands to take charity from Maharaj Bali. A person who wants to give everything in charity to Krishna but does not want anything in return is considered the real renouncer. Thus, a devotee will refuse to accept any kind of liberation, even if it is offered by the Lord. Real love of Krishna becomes manifested when Krishna becomes the recipient of charity and the devotee becomes the giver. In the Hari Bhakti Sudodaya, there is another example forwarded by Maharaj Dhruva. He says there, quote, My dear Lord, I have practiced austerities and penances because I was desiring to receive something from you, but in exchange you have allowed me to see you, who are never visible even to the great sages and saintly persons. I have been searching out some pieces of broken glass but instead I have found the most valuable jewel. I am therefore fully satisfied, my Lord. I do not wish to ask anything more from your Lordship. A similar statement is to be found in the third canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, 15th chapter, 48th verse. The four sages headed by Shanaka Muni address the Lord as follows, and uh, quote, my dear Supreme Personality of Godhead, your reputation is very attractive and free from all material contamination. Therefore, you are worthy of being glorified and are actually the reservoir of all pilgrimages. Auspicious persons who are fortunate enough to be engaged in glorifying your attributes and who actually know what your transcendental position is do not even care to accept liberation offered by you. Because they are so transcendentally enriched, they do not care to accept even the post of Indra, the heavenly king. They know that the post of the king of heaven is also fearful, 
whereas for those who are engaged in glorifying your transcendental qualities, there is only joyfulness and freedom from all danger. As such, why should persons with this knowledge be attracted by a post in the heavenly kingdom? End quote. One devotee has described his feelings about the charity exhibited by King Mayur, hmm, Mayuradvaj. That doesn't sound right. Mayuradvaj. Mayuradvaj. Ooh. Quote, I am faltering even to speak about the activities of Maharaj Mayuradvaj, to whom I offer my respectful obeisances. End quote. Mayura Dvaj was very intelligent, and he could understand why Krishna came to him once in the garb of a brahmana. Krishna demanded from him half of his body to be sawed off by his wife and son, and King Mayura Dvaj agreed to this proposal. On account of his intense feeling of devotional service, King Mayura Dvaj was always thinking of Krishna. And when he understood that Krishna had come in the garb of a brahmana, he did not hesitate to part with half of his body. The sacrifice of Maharaj Mayura Dvaj for Krishna's sake is unique in this world, and we should offer our all respectful obeisances to him. He had full knowledge of the Supreme Personality of Godhead in the garb of a brahmana, and he is known as the perfect Dhanavira, or renouncer. Any person who is always ready to satisfy Krishna, and who is always dexterous in executing devotional service, is called Dharmavira, or chivalrous in executing religious rituals. Only advanced devotees performing religious ritualistic performances can come to the stage of Dharmavira, Dharma viras are produced after going through the authoritative scriptures, following moral principles, being faithful and tolerant and controlling the senses. Persons who execute religious rituals for the satisfaction of Krishna are steady in devotional service, whereas persons who execute religious rituals without intending to please Krishna are only called pious. The best example of a Dharma Vira is Maharaj Yudhishthir. A devotee once told Krishna, quote, O dear Krishna, O killer of all demons, Maharaj Yudhishthir, the eldest son of Maharaj Pandu, has performed all kinds of sacrifices just to please you. He has always invited the heavenly king Indra to take part in the yagna's sacrifices. Because King Indra was thus absent so often from Sachi Devi. She had to pass much of her time pining over Indra's absence with her cheeks upon her hands. And the performance of different yagnas for the demigods is considered to be worship of the limbs of the Supreme Lord. The demigods are considered to be different parts of the universal body of the Lord, and therefore the ultimate purpose in worshiping them is to please the Lord by partially worshipping his different limbs. Maharaj Yudhishthir had no such material desire. He executed all sacrifices under the direction of Krishna and not to take any personal advantage from them. He only desired to please Krishna and was therefore called the best of the devotees. He was always merged in the ocean of loving service. All right, on to the next chapter, 47, Compassion and Anger. Does anyone want to add anything to this before I move on to the next chapter? Nope, doesn't look like it. Optimimula says, nope, not me. Okie doke. 47, Compassion and Anger. Compassion. When the ecstasy of devotional service... Oh, hi, Kandita. Haribo. Hare Krishna. I thought it was Saturday. Oh, <laughs> Nope. Still Friday. Greece says, 
who knows who to go to for body transplants. <laughs> He's talking about that last guy who had it. Krishna wanted half his body, yes. All right, compassion. Kandita, we're on page 416 of the PDF. Or page 377 of the book. Welcome. When the ecstasy of devotional service produces some kind of lamentation in connection with Krishna, it is called devotional service in compassion. The impetus of this devotional service is Krishna's transcendental quality, form, and activities. In this ecstasy of devotional service, there are sometimes symptoms like regret, heavy breathing, crying, falling on the ground and beating upon one's chest. Sometimes symptoms like laziness, frustration, defamation, humility, anxiety, moroseness, eagerness, restlessness, madness, death, forgetfulness, disease, and illusion are also visible. When in the heart of a devotee there is expectation of some mishap to Krishna, it is called devotional service in bereavement. Such bereavement is another symptom of this devotional service and compassion. In the Srimad Bhagavatam, 10th canto, 13th, or 16th chapter, 13th verse, there is the following description. When Krishna was chastising the Kali, Kaliya Naga in the Yamuna, the big snake wrapped his coils all over Krishna's body. And upon seeing Krishna in this situation, all his dear cowherd friends became greatly disturbed. Out of bereavement, distress, and fearfulness, they became bewildered and began to fall on the ground. Because the cowherd boys were under the illusion that Krishna could be in some mishap, their symptoms are not at all astonishing. They had dedicated their friendship, their possessions, their desires, and their very selves to Krishna. When Krishna entered the Yamuna River, which had become very poisonous from the presence of Kaliya, Mother Yashoda feared all kinds of mishaps, and she was breathing hotly. Tears from her eyes were soaking her clothes, and she was almost collapsing. Similarly, when the Shankasura demon was attacking Krishna's queens one after another, Lord Baladev became more and more bluish. In the Hamsa Duda, the following incident is described. The gopis requested Hamsa Duda to search after the marks of Krishna's lotus feet and to accept them as Lord Balaram had accepted them on his, or Lord Brahma had accepted them on his helmet after he had stolen all Krishna's cowherd boys. Regretting his challenge to Krishna, Lord Brahma had bowed down before the Lord and his helmet became marked with the footprints of Krishna. The gopis reminded Hamsa Duda that sometimes even the great sage Narada becomes very ecstatic by seeing these footprints, and sometimes great liberated sages also aspire to see them. You should therefore seek very enthusiastically to find the footprints of Krishna, they urged. This is another instance of devotional service and compassion. There is another instance when Sahadeva, the younger brother of Nakula, became greatly gladdened at seeing the effulgent glowing of Krishna's footprints. He began to cry and call out, Mother Madri, where are you? Father Pandu, where are you now? I'm very sorry that you're not here to see these footprints of Krishna. This is another instance of devotional service and compassion. In such devotional service and compassion, there are sometimes smiling symptoms, but never is there any stress or lamentation. The basic principle is always ecstatic love. The apprehension of some mishap to Krishna or to his beloved queens, as exhibited by Baladev and Yudhishthir, has been explained above. This apprehension is not exactly due to their ignorance of the inconceivable potencies of Krishna, but to their intense love for him. 
This kind of apprehension of some mishap to Krishna first of all becomes manifested as an object of lamentation, but gradually it develops into such compassionate, loving ecstasy that it turns to another channel and gives transcendental pleasure. What a great paragraph that is. All right, moving on to anger. In ecstatic loving service to Krishna in anger, Krishna is always the object. In Vidakta Madhava, 2nd Canto, 53rd verse, Lalita Gopi expressed her anger, which was caused by Krishna, when she addressed Srimati Radharani thus, quote, My dear friend, my inner desires have been polluted. Therefore, I shall go to the place of Yamaraj. But I am sorry to see that Krishna has still not given up his smiling over cheating you. I do not know how you could repose all your loving propensities upon this lusty young boy from the neighborhood of the cowherds. End quote. After seeing Krishna, Jodhiti sometimes said, quote, Oh, you thief of young girls' properties, I can distinctly see the covering garment of my daughter-in-law on your person. End quote. Then she cried very loudly, addressing all the residents of Vrindavan to inform them that this son of King Nanda was setting fire to the household life of her daughter-in-law. <laughs> Similar ecstatic love for Krishna and anger was expressed by Rohini Devi when she heard the roaring sound of the two falling Arjuna trees to which Krishna had been tied. So that's the whole Damodar pastime, right? So Mother Yashoda is nursing Krishna and she hears water boiling over in the kitchen. She gets up, puts him down, goes inside. Meanwhile, Krishna is really angry. He's breaking pots with his stick. He's doing all kinds of mischievous stuff. She ties him up, can't tie him up, strings too short, keeps doing it, strings too short, ropes too short, keeps trying it, not not working, ties him to the, the grinding stone, not working, not working. Finally, she's able to do it. She goes away for a little while, and he's so angry, he, run, he pulls the stone into the forest and knocks over two trees. These are the Arjuna trees. So there was a roaring sound. So that's what's being referred to here. So Rohini Devi took the opportunity to rebuke Mother Yashoda as follows. Quote, you may be very expert in giving lessons to your son by binding him with rope, but don't you look to see if your son is in a dangerous spot? The trees are falling on the ground, and he is simply loitering there. End quote. This expression of Rohini Devi's anger toward Yashoda is an example of ecstatic love in anger caused by Krishna. Bhaktivinoda says, Trying to remember how often I have said that I was angry at Krishna. Yeah. Reese says he's looking for butter, I bet. Yep, yep, looking for butter. Once, while Krishna was in the pasturing ground with his cowherd boys, his friends requested him to go to the Talavan forest, where Gardabasura was a disturbing demon in the shape of an ass, resided. The friends of Krishna wanted to eat the fruit from the forest trees, but they could not go because of the fear because of fear of the demon. Thus they requested Krishna to go there and kill, kill Gardabasura. After Krishna did this, they all returned home, and their report of the day's activity perturbed Mother Yashoda because Krishna had been sent alone into such danger in the Talavan forest. Thus she looked upon the boys with anger. There is another instance of anger on the part of a friend of Radharani's. When Radharani was dissatisfied with the behavior of Krishna and had stopped talking with him, Krishna was very sorry for Radharani's great dissatisfaction. And in order to beg forgiveness, he fell down at her lotus feet. But even after this, Radharani was not satisfied, and she did not, still did not talk with Krishna. 
that time, one of her friends chastised her in the following words, quote, My dear friend, you are allowing yourself to be churned by the rod of dissatisfaction. So what can I say unto you? The only advice I can give you is that you'd better leave this scene immediately because your misbehavior is giving me too much pain. I cannot bear to see your behavior because even though Krishna's peacock feather has touched your feet, you still appear to be red-faced." The above attitudes of dissatisfaction and anger in devotional service are called irishu. Issue. Issue. Yep. Issue. When Uddhava was leaving Vrindavan, some of the elderly gopis rebuked him as follows. Quote, O son of Gandini, your cruelty is defaming the dynasty of King Yadu. You are taking Krishna away, keeping us in such pitiable condition without him. Now, even before you have left, the life heir of all the gopis has practically disappeared." End quote. When Krishna was insulted by Shishupal in the assembly of Rajasuya Yajna, convened by Maharaj Yudhishthir, there was a great turmoil amongst the Pandavas and Kurus involving Grandfather Bhishma. At that time, Nikula said with great anger, quote, Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead and the nails of his toes are beautified by the light emanating from the jeweled helmets of the authorities of the Vedas. If he is derided by anyone, I declare herewith as a Pandava that I will kick his helmet with my left foot and I will strike him with my arrows, which were as good as Yamadanda, the scepter of Yamaraj." End quote. This is an instance of ecstatic love for Krishna in anger. In such a transcendental angry mood, sometimes sarcastic remarks, unfavorable glances, and insulting words are exhibited. Sometimes there are other symptoms like rubbing the two hands, clacking the teeth, clamping the lips, moving the eyebrows, scratching the arms, lowering the head, breathing rapidly, uttering strong words, nodding the head, exhibiting yellowishness at the corner of the eyes, and exhibiting trembling lips. Sometimes the eyes turn red, and sometimes they fade, and there is sometimes chastisement and silence. All these symptoms of anger can be divided into two parts, constitutional and unconstitutional, or permanent and temporary symptoms. Sometimes great emotion, bewilderment, bewilderment, pride, frustration, illusion, impotence, jealousy, dexterity, negligence, and signs of hard labor are also manifest as unconstitutional symptoms. In all these humors of ecstatic love, the feeling of anger is accepted as the steady factor. When Jarasandha angrily attacked the city of Mantra, he looked at Krishna with sarcastic glances. At that time, Baladev took up his plow weapon and gazed upon Jarasandha with colored eyes. There is a statement in the Vidagda Madhava wherein Srimati Radharani, in an angry mood, addressed her mother, Purnamasi, after she had accused Radharani of going to Krishna. Quote, my dear mother, what can I say to you? Krishna is so cruel that he often attacks me on the street. And if I want to cry out loudly, this boy with a peacock feather on his head immediately covers my face so that I cannot cry. And if I want to go away from the scene because I'm afraid of him, he will immediately spread his arms to block my path. If I piteously fall down at his feet, then his enemy then this enemy of the Madhu demon, in an angry mood, bites my face. Mother, just try to understand my situation, and don't be unnecessarily angry with me. Instead, 
Please tell me, how can I save myself from these terrible attacks of Krishna? End quote. That's a great place to stop right there. <laughs> so next week I'm going to, I'm going to take a little diversion and explain the, um, the structure of these, um, of these chapters. It starts out, it says Krishna is the object of, and the devotees are the, and then it starts going in and describing all these different things. And so next week I'm going to take a little diversion and, and just explain that structure of, of these chapters so that it's a little bit more um, apparent what's going on. It, when I first read this when I was younger, I was like, why is this, this huge long list of all of these things? So I'll explain that next week, why there are all these big long lists of all of these things and what is that all about. So we'll take a little diversion next week. All right. So. Oh. Okay, great. Great. Yeah, so we'll just take a little side trip there. All right. Well, thank you again for letting me read, and thank you to Srila Prabhupada. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Hare Krishna.